All right, welcome back. Let's keep talking about attitudes. But this time, as we continue talking about persuasion, let's talk about two really interesting topics, fear appeals and subliminal messaging. So first, when it comes to fear appeals, they're really all around us. This is an ad that I used to see a lot growing up. I don't think Michelin uses this tagline anymore, but they would often show their tires and a baby and they'd say Michelin because so much is riding on your tires. Now it's a very subtle fear appeal, but the whole idea is you need to buy a quality tire because if you don't, you might risk the health of your family. Well, it's, it's these types of fear appeals, subtle and stronger, that we really encounter on a regular basis. Here's just another example. Imagine that you're buying a car, and if you're buying a car, it's likely that the salesman will try to sell you an extended warranty. And again, this is really a subtle fear appeal because the whole idea is once your warranty runs out, you're gonna be so sad, so upset if your transmission goes bad. So one way to avoid that fear one way to avoid that anxiety is to buy this extended vehicle protection plan. So when it comes to these fear appeals, the basic idea is to create anxiety. And then we can reduce that anxiety by either changing our attitudes or changing our behaviors or both. Let's talk about some basic factors that relate to fear appeals. One basic principle of fear appeals is that mild fear may be ineffective. We have a lot of latitude. We need to determine how much fear we want to create when we have one of these messages. If we don't create enough anxiety, our message might not be motivating enough to change a person's attitude or their behavior. Here's a great example just from our own history when it comes to cigarette use. Of course, in general, in our society, we would like it if fewer people smoked. So by law, cigarette manufacturers need to include on their packaging the Surgeon General's warning. But you see, that fear appeal is somewhat ineffective. It's not very vivid. It doesn't really capture your attention. It's just a series of words. And although those words are pretty scary when you read them, that type of fear appeal probably doesn't create too much anxiety in a person who is a smoker or a person who is considering becoming a smoker. However, strong and really vivid fear appeals really do demand our attention. And as a result, they increase our motivation to think carefully about that message. In other words, they increase our motivation to process that information via the central route. Whereas this Surgeon General's warning might not create much fear, these very vivid pictures are likely to create quite a bit of fear and anxiety for people who are buying these packs of cigarettes. This example right here is another good one. It creates quite a bit of fear because the person who you see pictured obviously is very injured. It says not everyone who gets hit by a drunk driver dies. So this person is a victim. One thing I really like about this fear appeal is that it harnesses social strategy. See, I don't want to hurt anybody when I'm driving. And that person was obviously hurt by a drunk driver. So this type of ad really does get my attention and it motivates me to obey the law. So again, another basic principle is that fear appeals really do capture our attention. It's hard to ignore them. That said, fear appeals will indeed fail unless they provide some type of clear, reassuring advice for how you can avoid that threat, for how you can avoid that danger. Let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. One of the most well-known commercials that used fear was from a presidential campaign when Johnson was going up against Goldwater. And Johnson wanted people to believe that Goldwater was gonna kill us all by getting us into some huge war. The commercial began by showing a little girl and she had a, a daisy and she was picking the petals off of it. And she's really cute and she's, she's counting. She's saying one, two, five, nine. And then all of a sudden you hear a voice come on and it starts counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, boom. You see this huge explosion. And obviously we're left to believe that this girl is now dead. So this ad really did capture everybody's attention. It scared people because people were afraid of some type of huge war. But remember, a fear appeal is only going to be effective if we can tell people what they can do to avoid that danger. And what came next was President Johnson's voice. And what he said was, 
we must either love each other or we must die. And then there was a very clear message for what you could do to avoid that problem. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. Here's another example. It's a relatively good fear appeal. When we look at it, it gets our attention because we can see that this person has had a head injury and there's a nasty scar. We can also tell that this person can't feed himself and it looks like he's being fed by his grandmother. It says, I don't wear a helmet because it makes me look stupid. So we can understand the whole irony there as well. But here's a critical point. Does this fear appeal provide us with some advice for how to avoid the threat? Well, it's pretty obvious. If you don't want to have a head injury when you're riding a motorcycle, wear your helmet. So this particular ad does a decent job of getting our attention and then also giving us that message, you should wear a helmet if you want to be safe. This is really a key principle. It's not so hard to get people's attention. It's not so hard to scare them. But we need to provide them with some information about how to avoid that threat or our fear appeal in general is going to be ineffective. Here's a great example. Probably one of the best known fear appeals is the Scared Straight program. And in that program, kids who have been getting into trouble, they visit a prison. And then people who are convicted and in prison for life will talk to them and they will scare the crap out of them. And they will help these kids understand that you do not want to be in prison here with me. So they do a great job of scaring them. However, they don't really equip them with information about how they can avoid a life of crime once they leave. You can't simply tell a kid, hey, don't engage in bad behavior. Because when this kid goes home and then he uh, hangs out again with his best friends who are getting into trouble, what exactly do you want him to do? Uh, these kids might be part of gangs, for example. What do you want them to do? Just simply ignore their gang now? Ignore the people who are their best friends? So all I'm saying is scaring people is relatively easy, but if we expect them to simply change change their behaviors simply because we scared them, we are oversimplifying the situation. So just to summarize, we can scare people pretty easily, but if we don't provide them with a clear plan for avoiding the danger, our fear appeal will probably fail. Well, fear is just one strategy for changing attitudes. Let's talk about another one that's really much more positive. Let's talk about positive emotions. You've probably heard the phrase that you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. And when you think about people who are happy, who are in a good mood, those happy, positive people, they tend to be more agreeable, more sociable, and more generous. They also tend to make quicker decisions that are based on less thought. And that's interesting because if they're making decisions based on less thought, that means they are not scrutinizing messages quite as carefully as they normally would. So in other words, that makes them more open to peripheral route processing and more open to our persuasive attempts. Why is it that they're more likely to engage in peripheral route processing? Well, there's some evidence to show that they might be trying to avoid central route processing simply to maintain their good mood. Because, you know, critical thinking isn't always really fun. And sometimes you discover things that are going to spoil your good mood. What's the take home message? To be persuasive, try to be nice. That, my friends, is good advice. All right, let's switch gears. As we continue to talk about different types of messages, let's talk now about subliminal messages, which is always an interesting topic related to persuasion. In general, when we're talking about subliminal messages, we're talking about information that's being presented to you even though it's outside of your conscious awareness. Let me give you an example. Let's just kind of ease into this. When you look at a package of Camel cigarettes, it's pretty famous. A lot of people think that they can see in here a pattern that, that looks like a, maybe a naked woman. And the way in which that could be subliminal is because most people don't notice that. It's situations like this, examples like this, that I like to think of as subliminal but in plain sight. I mean, it's right there, right? So if you look for it, you're going to see it. So in that sense, it's not subliminal. But think about if people really notice it just naturally on an everyday basis. So if you were to just look at this package, probably less than half of the time, you would notice that there's some type of pattern in there. Now, whether the pattern was in there purposely or if it was unintended, that's completely a different issue. Let me give you another example that falls into that same category where it's somewhat subliminal, but it's in plain sight. 
Wendy's recently created a new logo. And when you look at the logo, it looks nice and all. And one thing that people don't typically perceive, but they still might be influenced by it, is what looks like the word mom that is within the girl's collar of her shirt. And why would they want the word mom in there? Well, they say it's not intentional, and maybe it's not. Um, but let's say it is. The whole idea is the word mom is good, and we associate mom with pleasant things, and we associate mom with good, wholesome cooking. And obviously, they would want their burgers and their chili to be associated with that. So this is another example where we're not necessarily talking about a subliminal presentation of information, but people are not likely to consciously notice that information most of the time. So can subtle messages like that influence us? Well, the bottom line is yes. You know, I mean, we, we know that we can process information unconsciously, and we know that we can be influenced by subliminal primes. If you look at basic research in cognitive psychology that's been conducted for decades, you will see that that's simply a fact. That is not something that can be challenged. But, and here's a big but, let's not oversimplify this discussion because we're not talking about just being somewhat influenced by some subliminal prime. When we're talking about subliminal persuasion, there's really very little evidence that the presentation of subliminal primes will actually change attitudes or behaviors or maybe some personality characteristic like self-esteem. Evidence of that occurring is actually quite limited. So when we're talking about subliminal persuasion, now we're talking about situations like this. So imagine you're in a movie theater, and here we see the heads of the people. And they're watching a screen, and maybe it's before the movie, and they're showing a variety of different things to us. Imagine if you see this pop up on the screen, but it's not popping up on the screen and staying there. It's popping up on the screen for maybe like one third of a second. So again, about half of the time, maybe people perceive that it was there, and about half of the time, people don't. That would be a good example of a subliminal presentation of a message designed to get you to go do something, buy a Coke or eat some popcorn. So what we're trying to determine for purposes of this discussion is, is a subliminal message like that going to be effective in actually changing your behavior, getting you to get up and go buy a drink, getting you to get up and go buy something to eat? Well, before we talk about that example, let's talk about another one that's a little bit more straightforward. There's an entire industry that is geared toward creating, it used to be audio tapes or DVDs, now it just might be straight MP3 files, in which maybe there's someone speaking or maybe there's some type of music. And then underneath that, there are some subliminal messages that are geared to get you to maybe have a higher self-esteem or maybe geared to help you lose weight. And the research on those types of products is really very clear. Subliminal self-help products have no proven therapeutic effects. Now, keep in mind, it's pretty complex when we're talking about trying to get you to change your attitude about yourself. That's what your self-esteem is, right? I mean, is it reasonable for us to think that some messages that are presented to us uh, that we can typically not even hear, not even perceive, are going to really have a fundamental change on how we view ourselves? That's pretty unlikely. And as you would expect, there's no evidence to show that that works. Is it likely that we can listen to uh, a recording and then fundamentally change the way that we deal with food and eat less and exercise and lose weight? That's, that's a really complex set of changes that would need to take place. So as you would assume, these types of products are typically proven to be ineffective. Well, let's go back to this example. Is there any evidence that presenting a subliminal message such as this is gonna actually change someone's behavior and get them to go buy a product? Well, there's interesting evidence with this. And in some very simple situations, there could actually be an effect. And the bottom line is that subliminal primes can influence very simple behaviors or very simple attitudes, at least over the short term, when people are already motivated to take some type of action. So if I'm already kind of hungry or I'm already kind of thirsty, and I'm presented with that subliminal message, I might be more likely to get up and buy that Coke or buy that popcorn. Let's look at some evidence from a research study that tested that. I love this research study, and the primary thing that I love about it is that the key manipulation was trying to have some research subjects who are thirsty 
and some research subjects who are not thirsty. So how could we manipulate that in the lab? Well, there are really a variety of ways. One of the key things that you can do is have them wait for a while. So let's say they're waiting, uh, maybe in a waiting room. Let's say they're doing just some other tasks that they believe are part of the study. And we know that over time, people get thirsty. That's just natural. Well, half of the people we can randomly assign to give them water. And the other half we might randomly assign to get no water. So now, an hour or so later, we have two groups of people. Some who have been drinking water, and we'd assume that they're not thirsty. Others have not been drinking water, and we would assume naturally they're getting thirsty. Now the real study begins. So in this particular study, they believed that they were essentially engaging in a taste test of some different beverages. So we had thirsty people and people who are not thirsty. And when they were engaging in these taste tests, of course, the researchers later on could measure how much did they drink. Well, they were engaging in a task on a computer and they were presented with some primes on the computer. And those primes were presented subliminally. So again, they're presented so quickly that about half of the time you can perceive what you saw in front of you, but about half the time you could not. Some of the people were presented with primes that were related to thirst and drinking. So they might have seen words like thirsty or dry or drink. Other people were presented with primes that were relatively neutral words. So they had nothing to do with thirstiness and drinking. So let's see what we found. For the research subjects who were not thirsty, there was no difference in how much of the beverage they drank, depending on if they were seeing thirsty primes or neutral primes. So the subliminal messages for the people who were not thirsty had no effect on how much they drank. But here there was a difference. For the thirsty participants, when they were presented with thirsty related primes, they drank more of the beverage than the thirsty people who were presented with neutral primes. So this is where some people say you need to strike when the iron is hot. If people are hungry, if people are thirsty, then our primes for them to buy food and drink might be effective. But if people are not hungry, if people are not thirsty, our primes that are trying to get them to change their behaviors are likely to fail. So this was a really interesting study and it helps give us a more reasonable idea of what we can expect from subliminal persuasion. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. Thank you.